Right, so that's the uh, primer coat on. There's uh, actually three coats of high bill primer. I've now got to rub it down. I can still see the pressing lines in the uh, primer. Hopefully that will have gone by the time I finish flatting it. So the next step, if I move you down here, sorry for the sudden movement, and the rather wobbly camera control, I can see some very minor imperfections that I haven't addressed with the filling, but they are minor. So it's the surface now, really, that we need to address. So to make sure it is as flat as I can possibly get it, I need a bit of, a, a bit of aerosol black, which I will then allow to dry, and then flat off and the black will let me see any uh, low spots. So we shall come back to this once I've flatted that off. So the uh, Geico is dry. To knock it down we're going to use some uh, 800s wet and dry and lots of soapy water. So I shall rub that down and let you have a look and see what I found once it's done. Right, we're about 45 minutes on. I've done an awful lot of sanding to get rid of the uh, black guy coat. And that you end up, hopefully, with something nice and smooth like that. With all the black gone. Rub through here, whereas uh, I've still got a bit more work to do around this edge. That rippling in there is from the pressing, the original pressing. So I'm not going to get too worried about that. Where I've gone through like that, I will just use a bit of aerosol to cover the bare steel and then give it a very light tickle off. And the only place so far that I've found any thing that worries me, or well, doesn't worry me, but the Fender tip where I had to be welding and filling. There are a couple of small pot marks from the filler. So I will spin this round and show you and I'll just mention what I'm going to do to address that. Right, and on the back of the mud guard, I don't know if you're able to see this because they are very, very small. There are three little chips there, three little chips there. There's a very tiny amount of marking there, but it's, you can't feel it. So, to get rid of them, I'm going to use a bit of cellular stopper, which I'm meant to apply with a fine scraper, applicator I should say. But I haven't got one here. So, and to be honest, that's the only thing I've found, particularly. There are various small imperfections in the metal generally, you know, where it's been pressed and where there's slight lifting at the edges of holes and things, which I'm not going to be bothered about. There's a couple of places where I've rubbed down to the uh, etch primer and a couple of very small places where I've gone down to the metal on, particularly on studs where I wasn't being very careful. So I'll flash that off, as in let it dry. I'll sand that off to smooth. I'll then re-aerosol that and the other bits I mentioned. And then I think this is ready for the base coat. I hope so. I haven't found anything else yet. And I'm particularly pleased that given the amount of filling I had to do on this, that this is really the only bit I found with the uh, pop marks. And they are very small. To be honest, you might even have got away with it. 
but might as well try and do the best job you can. I mentioned earlier the marks made by the stamp that created this mudguard. Now, as you can see, I haven't started rubbing this down properly yet, but you can probably see the, the lines which go right round both sides from where the metal stretched downwards as the, uh, as the shape was stamped out of a solid piece of steel. I'm hoping that my sanding will get rid of these, but I thought I'd just show you them. I mean, they're not horrendous by any stretch of imagination, but if you're painting or trying to paint something that you want a nice finish from, I've got to try and get these down as much as I can. But I thought I'd show you them just so you know what I was rabbiting on about earlier, in case you think I'm mad or deluded, or both. Right, the uh, flatting's all done. The only real point of interest was the uh, stamping marks, which have come out really well everywhere. You can probably just still see lines there, but that's because I've rubbed down to the etch primer, which is shadowing through, which makes it look worse than it is. You can't feel anything there. So I think we're going to go for the base coat. And here it is, a very high glitter silver. And there it is in its metallic silver. It was slightly challenging. It there was a tendency for it to want to wrinkle. I had to uh, mess about with the percentage of thinners to paint away from the manufacturer's own recommendation, which is never good. But whether it's the fact it's still quite cold in here, or whether the fact my spray gun won't atomize quite as well, as a professional gun, I don't know. But anyway, it's on. It's even. I can't do any more. So we now have to turn our attention to the colour we're going to apply. So let's go and have a look at that. And there it is. It's hard to tell what it is. Looking in there, it's um, Candy Purple Passion. Now you can probably just see it at the top of the stick. No, you probably can't. There we are. Probably see it at the top of the stick. That's probably roughly what it was going to come out like. Uh, I will be erring on the lighter side because I will now cut to a clip of an image I found online of a 1973 FLH, and that's roughly the colour I'm looking for. So have a quick look at that. And there's the candy on. It's uh, a fairly light purple I'm going for. Don't want it too dark. Um, it will look slightly darker when the lacquer's on. It will also change colour outside. So I'm hoping it's going to look okay. I think it's uh, pretty much in the colour range I want at the minute. But, uh, you know, you've got to go with something. And this is it. So the next stage is to lacquer it. Right, there it is. Out in the sunshine. It has a good shine to it. It has darkened very slightly with the lacquer on. It's the sort of colour I was aiming for. The finish is not what you get from your local body shop, but... For a domestic garage, it's perfectly acceptable. And when that's bolted on the bike, I don't think anyone's going to be pointing at it going, that's disgusting. 
So that will get put away inside now. Whilst I get on with the back mud guard, I won't bother showing you the back mud guard unless something terrible goes wrong. I will show you the petrol tank because that's obviously going to be slightly different. So another long day in the garage ahead covered in paint. Right, I've moved the camera inside along with the uh, mud guard, which is going to be stored in here for a while. And this is a more accurate reflection of the darkness of the colour. But for some reason, the CCD on the camera, is that the right word? Yeah, the, the sensor uh, is making the colour lighter and more blue, which may be because it's candy, I don't know. Either way, it's not giving a true reflection of the colour. So possibly I may have to take a photograph in RAW, manipulate the colour and put it up later. But anyway, that's nearer the darkness shade-wise. So watch this space. Okay, I wasn't going to uh, show you the mudguard, but being fickle, I've changed my mind. There it is in place. And the reason I'm showing it is because I can't remember if I showed you these. In an earlier video, they were in grey primer and uh, the chrome was flaking off these shocks. Sadly, it's all too far gone to do anything with. So I uh, removed all the flaking paint, uh, sorry, flaking chrome, sanded them down, hit them with silver, and then lacquered them just to make them look a little bit smarter. I've touched in various bits on the swinging arm, which is slightly dusty at the minute because I haven't wiped it down, which I forgot. But anyway, the swinging arm looks better again, the rust's gone. Same as the little bits of rust that are on the frame around this area there, that's all been touched in just to make it look a little bit smarter. Um, rear lights on, rear lights wired up. I made a short loom in wrapped in tape up to where the battery was and the remaining wires were that I mentioned. And I was going to fit proper multi-plug, but because of the current situation I can't get hold of one. And that's unlikely to change for some weeks yet. So I've just used scotch locks and tucked them all out, out of the way and I can replace them at a later date. Tail light works, brake light works, the wiring's there for the indicators which will come through this hole. Is it that hole? Maybe it's not that hole. Maybe it's a hole over there, I can't remember. Anyway, there is a hole. There's enough wire for them to uh, connect up the indicators once I get the bar that fits on here. The bottom of the mud guard, where I filled it, welded it, filled it, has come out rather well. It's uh, nice and straight. The arch is good. I probably still will end up putting a fender tip on it because apparently you can uh, get reproductions with 1200 on, like the uh, original fitment would have been, which quite fancy and only about 25 quid but again that will have to wait until uh, this current crisis is over and I can start ordering things again. Number plate brackets back on it will need some messing about with to make a UK number plate fit it. I'm gonna have to drill that I think and make up spaces. I'm not sure yet but that's what it looks like. I may even put a support piece in to, to come higher because the British UK number plate that I've got comes up to about there. Anyway, they're, they're by the by, really. The point is it's in. I still haven't got a back tyre. Um, I will order one, see when it comes, who knows. Uh, stuff I'm ordering at the minute, some of it's coming in 48 hours and some of it's taking two weeks. So, I don't know. But anyway, it's done. So we can turn our attention to the front end now because I can't do any more here until I get the tyre and get the back wheel in. Right, there's the uh, front one in place. 
Now the only way I could see to get it on, and I made it because I'm very stupid, is because the way the cutouts are and the uh, bracket is for the brakes, I had to turn this fork leg through 180 degrees, drop the uh, mudguard down until the cutouts were above. Sorry, let me restart that again. I had to turn this through 180 degrees, put the mudguard in high but with the cutouts up here which then allowed me to turn it back to where it is now and drop the mudguard down. It's the only way I could see of doing it. There may be another way, but I couldn't work it out if there was. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's in, it's on. Uh, we're going to do the wheel next and then address the brakes. Uh, but the front end is starting to look an awful lot nicer than the uh, matte black and grey primer finish it was when I got it so I'm quite happy with that so far things touch wood are going reasonably well the petrol tank is obviously the big uh, issue and we will be dealing with that soon I might build the brakes up next so the front end's done we shall see right well we're uh, up at the sharp end I might as well stick the uh, caliper on. So, I may get in your way slightly here because the things are very cramped. I've had to uh, uh, had to move the Harley when I had some domestic stuff in, and I can't move it back until I get the wheels on. So I am trapped in a corner here. So hopefully I won't get in your way. We shall see how we go. So a bit of copper slip on the back of our pad. Bit of copper slip. Just a smear on our uh, pivot pins. So that stays there. And then two brake pad pins, which hopefully will stay in place as well. We shall see. That goes in there like that. We'll rest down on there for a second. And then, oh, we're missing a bit. Right, one second, because we're missing a part. Sorry about that, I don't know how I managed to forget this little bit. Our anti-rattle spring thing, whatever shim, you know, whatever you want to call it, I don't know. Which must go there like that, surely. Mm. Didn't really pay attention to which way around that went, did I? That is right. Uh, that's strange. I thought that would have gone over that second part, but obviously it doesn't. But anyway, put a bit of copper slip on the back of the second pad. A little bit of copper slip on our stud. I hope we can still see all this. And then that, in theory, well, it would do. Put them on first, I think. That will help line up those pins. So in theory, they should all go together. In theory, like that. Lovely. So then we have our mounting bolts.
Right, I won't film you. Sorry, I won't film me putting in all four mounting bolts because you can see exactly what I'm about to do. So I'll bring you back when I've got all four of those in place. Right, they're in and they're run down. So the final job is to uh, torque them back up. £30 minimum according to the uh, workshop manual. Which is quite a lot really for caliper house, but there you go. That's what it says. And I'd say they're all good. So if you recall, before we did all the pin work and stuff, the caliper rocked about. There's nothing there now. The sideways rattle because it's not been bled yet. But up and down. Negligible. Which is very good. So just before we leave the front end. I'll just mention. Which I forgot to completely mention. Is of course I fitted the front wheel. The blue stuff is uh, protecting the white wall on the tyre, which hopefully will wash off fairly easily when the time comes. So I need to connect the hose to the master cylinder and then uh, bleed the brakes, which I'm hoping will be straightforward, but we shall see, won't we, in a minute. So I'll just sort all that out and then... Uh, come back to that. Right, I've bled brakes. I've used DOT4 fluid, which is uh, standard brake fluid, just a, an upgrade on DOT3, which is what it would have had originally. It bled up fairly promptly because everything's new. I didn't use any tools or air or anything like that. I just used a straightforward squeeze whilst uh, covering the nipple with my finger and then releasing. You've probably seen loads of it before on YouTube. You've probably done loads of it yourself on YouTube. Not on YouTube, but yourself anyway. I now have a functioning piston, a solid brake, just to make sure there is no residual air. I've cable, I don't know if you can see that very well because what's around it. I've cable tied the uh, Brake lever back, so it's under pressure. Just go down tapping the line just to make to encourage any air to work its way back up. I'll leave it like that overnight now probably. And in the morning hopefully I'll have a good solid lever without any pumping up. I'm fairly confident. Things went quite well. And if that's the case. The front end's done. We have a functioning brake, new wheels on, calipers rebuilt, there's no movement in it, pads are in, which just leaves the back end, which is tyre reliant, as I said before. So the next episode will depend on the arrival of the tyre, but in the meantime I'll probably end it here and start the next one with work on the petrol tank.